uh, the Python landscape has been growing in a way. So you have traditional packages like NumPy and SciPy, which if, if you use Python for a while in, sci in the scientific format, you've used those packages most likely. Uh, but then you, and, and matplotlib for visualization. But then you have new packages coming out uh, that are really having a large impact. So things like pandas, which is a data frame for Python, a lot like R's data frame. There's scikit-learn, which is this really nice machine learning library. It's not the first, and it's certainly not the only one. But it has a great interface uh, that allows for an API that you can parallelize quickly, if you'd like, for example. Uh, there's IPython Parallel, which is a very fault-tolerant way to execute thousands of simulations. There's uh, Spark, which I'm actually really excited about Spark. So I put in some Spark examples today. Spark is a map reduce like framework, but it's in memory, it's very fast, and it has more functionality than just map and reduce. So we'll talk about that today, hopefully. <laughs> and, uh, and then you have traditional things like uh, HDF5 has a few interfaces to it, like pi tables and HDF5. There's also MPI for pi, and we're not going to talk about those. Uh, so there's a, lot, there's a lot happening. And then on top of all that, if that wasn't good enough, there's also this IPython notebook. And it's a very, very cool web-based interactive framework. And you can do all these things from the notebook. And so we'll do some of that today. Like it. So the objectives, really, one, one of the big goals is just to become familiar with the IPython notebook and run some examples, if you like it. So I'd be happy if that's all we did. But um, I'd also like to just introduce some of the packages out there that you could use. And unfortunately, with just two hours, <laughs> maybe even a little less, you probably can't go too deep into any of these. So here's, here's a couple of questions just to think about. Uh, talking about data analysis, how do you currently sort of wrangle data? And that could be reshape it from its current format into something you can plot or something you can analyze. How do you visualize your results? You probably have a tool that you like to use for that. How do you perform statistical analysis? Or if you do some machine learning, like PCA or linear regression, you know, what tools do you use to do that? And then how would you run, say, 1,000 simulations in parallel? And, that, and, that, and that's becoming such a common thing. It should be really easy. surprisingly difficult for people to have a, a tool that they can do that with. Uh, data is getting a little bigger quickly. The tsunami is coming, apparently, and of data, that is. And you, know, you have a tool in your toolbox that allows you to plow through a terabyte of data interactively and kind of quickly. And the answer for a lot of folks is no. And so I think what I'm excited about is Python is providing a lot of capabilities in this way. So here's. Here's an outline. I'll talk about the IPython notebook a little bit, probably kind of quickly, and I might skip a few things. Then we'll do some, we'll log into an Amazon instance, and you can run through the code that I'm discussing uh, while I run through it. So you won't have to actually type any Python code, but you can kind of see it in action, and that's sort of a good intermediate result, and it goes a little quicker. Uh, and I think we'll work, we'll work on functional Python, because functional, the functional programming model becoming really popular for distributed computing, and we need it for IPython Parallel and Spark. Uh, we'll talk about the Pandas library, and then we'll do some, some parallel examples, and we might do them all. We might have to skip one so we get to Spark. And then, and then you can just sit back and relax and enjoy the Spark portion, uh, because that's not on Amazon. <laughs> okay, does anybody have any questions before we get rolling? Oh, I haven't explained. Yeah, so if you got a piece of paper, I haven't explained it yet. So that's a great point. I'm going to hold off a minute on explaining it. I will say that if you go to the web page, uh, you don't have to do any of the Amazon things. You can click on the outline, and you'll be able to follow along just the HTML, and it's got the answers. Um, I also put some extra things that I, we're not going to have time to cover, but I just couldn't leave them out. And we might have time if we hurry. 
And then I have some links at the bottom to everything we're talking about. So uh, I'll get to the Amazon in about 20 minutes or so. Any other questions? Okay. So, so before we talk about the notebook, let's just talk about Python. There's a lot of different languages. How many people use Python? Oh, yeah. OK. So just you don't even have to raise your hand. Just yell out your favorite thing about Python. Ready, go. I can't hear you. You have to really yell. What's that? Interactive. Bam, I love interactive Python. Yes, what else? It's free. Yeah, as in beer and as in uh, you know, open. <laughs> what else? Easy, yeah, the syntax is easy. It's easy to learn. All the good ones. Anybody else? What's that? ArcGIS uses it, yeah. That's right. But what's that? It's super fun. Think of all the fun we're having already. OK, those are, that's a good list. I made a little list also. Uh, it has very simple, clean syntax. We've already hit easy to learn, interpreted. It's strong, dynamically typed. Runs everywhere. I think that's pretty cool. You can run it on just about any box. Uh, it's free. It's expressive. And, and I think that's one of the things I love about it. With very few lines of code, you can do quite a bit of work. And there's one I didn't put in here, but it's, it has a lot of abstraction. And of course, you've got several options and programming styles you can work with. So procedural, object-oriented, and functional. If you haven't if you haven't used functional, we'll talk about what that means in Python at a very high level. Here's, here's an abstraction I just wanted to show you. And I hope you can see that. Um, I'm reading in an HDF5 file, uh, two of them actually, and then I'm multiplying them together with the NP dot. So this is the NumPy package and the Pi tables package. And it's, I don't know, 10 lines of code or something like that. And what I love about Python is I can I can write this almost without going to Google to figure out how to do it, right? I mean, most of this I can do. And if I compare it to my C or C++ implementation, which I did on a Janus supercomputer, and the x-axis I'm making the matrix really big. So I think the 25,000 by 25,000 is probably like 6 gigs or something. So I've got three of those in memory. And then uh, time is on the y-axis, and it's in a log scale. So I'm comparing my C++ implementation, where I use HDF5's C library and the math kernel library from Intel. And I'm comparing it with NumPy that's using the exact same stuff underneath. So I compiled NumPy with MKL, and I'm using Pi tables. And voila, you can't tell the difference. And that is so amazing. So I get all this benefit without actually having to learn the interface to these libraries. And believe me, when I write the C version, either with Intel or with HDF5, I always have to go to Google. So uh, I think Python's pretty awesome that way in terms of abstraction. So let's get the notebook for a few minutes. The notebook is, is a web-based Python environment. So you can execute Python code through a web browser. But you can also embed text and video and LaTeX and HTML and all kinds of things inside the notebook. You can run them locally on your Mac, or you can run them on your favorite cluster resource, which is very cool. And it makes it very easy to share the results. So here's kind of the traditional, or at least one traditional option. You have, you're logged into your favorite machine, which could be your local machine, just a terminal. You've got an editor open. Maybe you have an IDE. And then you want to do some interactive data analysis. So you've got a plot window that pops open, and you Alt-Tab around, or you click and point around those things. And what the notebook does is it sort of allows you to stay in a single window. And you get this inline plotting and inline commenting. And the comments aren't like a you know, pound sign for Python or something with a, with a comment. It's, it's LaTeX, or it's, it's Markdown, which looks like it's an easy way to generate HTML. So you can have really rich comments. Uh, really nice displays, all in line in a notebook that's very easy to share. 
So we'll be playing with that today. Uh, this is just to say you're not separating your code and your text and your results. They're all together kind of in the same document, and it's great for telling stories. It's not, it's not as great if you're doing sort of an object-oriented programming model where you're building this large object. I would stay in a file there, but you can always run the model from the notebook. Just to say that you can run it locally, remotely, you can run it anywhere you want and it looks the same on, from, from your perspective. And that's actually kind of a, an interesting point. If you're back at the traditional model where you pop and open a window and you have an editor and you've got a terminal, you've got to be careful to SSH, you know, dash X or Y that session so you can do this kind of X term around thing. And with the IPython notebook, you don't have to do that. You just, you just log into the browser and you get everything you need to sort of work on your results. It's a little convenient there, too. You can, uh, you can export these in a variety of ways. So the, the slides you're looking at, this is actually an IPython notebook just running a slideshow. You, the slides you might have looked at online were just generated from the notebooks quickly. And I'll show you how to do that. You can also generate this right to LaTeX if you want. And it'll give you a PDF or a LaTeX file. So there's a lot of ways to share. There's also an online service called IPython Notebook Viewer, where you can just, you know, if you like GitHub or if you like Gists, you can just save these as Gists and look at them, you know, display them through a, a web viewer. There's, there's some shortcuts, and I think the only one you need to know today is Shift Enter. <laughs> but if you're going to use this, you want to memorize a few other ones too. And so I highlighted, I don't know, the 10, the 10 that I use all the time. But shift enter just says go from this cell to the next cell. And I'll demo that in a second. And for today, that's really all you have to do is shift enter. You can double click on cells to edit them and things like that. Uh, there's different kinds of headings, and uh, you can move cells around with keyboards, shortcuts, but shift enter is what we need today. Um, I mentioned, I'm going to skip over some of this because we have so many interesting things to do. I don't want to bog down here. This is actually kind of, I want to show this video. So this is, here I'm using, um, I'm using the IPython display YouTube video object to, to display YouTube video. And this is Fernando Perez. He started the IPython project. He was a CU student in Boulder. And what he's, this is actually in 2011. And I just want to start it here. He's showing how, oh, and you're not going to hear this. Let me see if I have a many of you do these very nice visualizations that the New York Times does with D3. Uh, D3 is a library out of Stanford. Um, well, we have an extension called D3 Graph now. And so if I now, I now load, simply display the same object after having loaded, <laughs> after, OK, so what's the point there? So has anybody followed kind of the New York Times and their new visualization with D3? It's kind of this incredible JavaScript library. It's highly interactive in the web, and it's kind of changing visualization for the web. Well, uh, they ported it to some Python libraries. So if you're in the web browser in IPython Notebook already, you can actually do some of your, your analysis with D3 if you'd like. And of course, everybody got really excited at PyCon here. Um, Show the video. Let's see. I think this is embedded plots. And so part of what this example is just showing is if you have some sort of data structure, in this case I just have a NumPy vector, and I want to see what's in it, I just hit X and hit return. And just like I'm in the shell, I can kind of see sort of the contents of this. And it, it does all the right things where it doesn't display the whole thing and put the ellipse where I need them. And then I can also just, you know, if I want to look at a histogram of this, I can just type hist. And it shows me the histogram right below. And it's all embedded in the notebook. I think, I think I've hit that point already. Uh, one, one other thing I like about it is it's totally customizable. So it's just, this is just a web interface. So you can modify the CSS to make it look differently. You can add JavaScript if you want. You don't have to, be, you don't have to just accept the current look and feel of IPython notebook. You can also roll your own output formats if you'd like to do that. Um, 
there's, there's these things called magic commands, and I'm going to plow through these. I would encourage you just to look through these again. And I just want to point out, for those of you that love R and ggplot, that you can execute uh, R from Python and from the notebook viewer. And so if you would prefer to use ggplot for something, you can send your data with the R magic commands and plot your, plot your stuff in ggplot, if you'd like. And you can do that with Bash, and you can do that with Julia. You can do it with uh, Ruby. So there's a lot of ways to kind of use Python with other languages through the notebook. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide, too. It's just, if you, are, if you do want to run this on a remote cluster, it kind of has the steps you need to take. Most, most of the time, you have to log in, launch the notebook, and then tunnel back to it, because rarely are, are your your cluster supercomputer is going to open ports that would allow that. And there's some help here if you'd like to see it. And I'll, I'm going to demo logging into Janus in a second. Um, yeah, I think that's good. So let's do, oh, not conclusions yet. Come back to that slide. What I want to do now is have you guys log into Amazon instances. So I've got one going here. I, and I apologize, you have to type in that long Amazon text string. Um, I couldn't figure out a way to have to give people a, an online link without everybody trying to log into the same one accidentally. So type that string in. It should bring up a should bring up a, a certificate with a big yellow page that says, you know, this isn't verified. It's you should just accept it and trust that there's nothing. Nothing bad is going to happen. And hopefully when you do that, you get to a screen that looks like this. What I might do is just, let's just take five minutes to everybody to get on that, on that screen. And I'll just come around. And if you're, if you're not there. Yeah, so this, what you're going to see once you accept it is sort of the the browser for the IPython notebook. And you can kind of go anywhere in your system you want with that now. Is anybody having some issues? Just raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, you, you can't share, but let me get you one. Uh, these are... okay. uh, go to the Go to the one that has Amazon in it. <laughs> and sorry about the double HTTP. That's a mistake. <laughs> There you go. Does anybody else, would anybody else like a login? Doesn't have one? Got a few extra. That's your chance. Yeah. And, oh, and then put your password as RC. Anybody need some help or a login? Yeah, so you mean if you wanted to run it locally? Yes, yeah. So you can create your own notebooks if you'd like. And these are your instances, so if you want to do something else while we're talking, you can. Yeah. Oh, um, if you go back to that that page, yeah, you can hit new notebook and it will bring one up. Okay, is everybody? We probably didn't need five minutes. Everybody running that wants to be? Okay, hold on. Oh, do HTTP. Yeah. 
Any anybody else? Okay. Is yours still empty? Hit refresh and see. Okay. Oh, yeah, so if you were to run these on your local machine, you don't have to log in. So, for example, and I'll just show you, I'm on my Mac here. Um, I'm going to kill this and just restart. So here is bigger so you can see it. So here's how I would log in. I would say IPython notebook. Because I have IPython on my Mac and it says, there you go, and it brings up this window. I didn't have to log in. I'm just running locally. Uh, the reason we're on Amazon is because, one, I wanted everybody to have a couple cores to play with. Two, it's really hard for everybody to be on the same software uh, version. And this is such bleeding edge code that you could be off by 0.0 inversion, and it won't work. So uh, I've t I tested everything this morning. Man, I hope it works. So, so let's do this. Uh, go into the folder. You sh oops, I'm in the wrong spot. Let me go back to Amazon here. So go into this CSDMS folder, and let's go to initialize. And this, just run this notebook. And the way you can do that is you can say cell run all. And it should be really quick. This just grabs data. If you don't already have it, you should have it. And it gives you some more pleasing uh, matplotlib options. So again, you just go up to cell and run all. And there's nothing we really need to talk about here. This is just, we just want to do that one step. OK. I'm going to close that. And you can shut that notebook down when you get back to the page. And then let's go to Python. And you should see something that looks like this. Everybody, everybody kind of seeing this? So I thought we would do the scientific hello world. So if you click in the box and you hit Shift Enter, it should execute this code. And there's just a ton going on here. So let's just really quick talk about it. Uh, I import the future print function because I like it. You don't have to do that. It just means you put parentheses around print instead of a space. So that's what the first line does. Uh, import math. So in Python, and some of this is going to be reviewed, I'll go quick. In Python, if you want to use a package that's not part of the you know, standard C Python when it, when it is initialized, you just import it. So in this case, I'm importing math. There's a lot of ways you could do that. You could say from math import star. You could say import math as M if you wanted. Uh, I think import math is very common. And if you do import math, you've got to keep everything. You've got you to reference all its methods and variables from the math namespace, which is a good thing. It keeps a namespace collision from happening. So uh, we do, first thing I do is I cast a string, 4.2, as a float. So in Python, you can, you can cast variables back and forth. In this case, I just say float parenthesis. And then I store that value in R. And then I say math.sign R. And I store that value in S. So I'm just kind of, really, I'm just kind of flexing scientific Python muscles here a little bit, right? Um, we're not doing anything useful. And, and then I call the print statement. And I'm using the new format, kind of string formatting. So I say, hello world, the sign. And I have curly brackets 0. That means the first thing I'm going to pass the format command. Um, equals, and then I have 
the curly brackets with one colon, and the one means it's the second thing I'm going to pass. And then I have a little formatting string after that, which is 0.2f, and then I say dot format rs, and that's it. And so then it passes uh, the value of r, which is 4.2, and it passes the value of s, which is 0.87, and it formats it for me. So, um, so that's a pretty compact little chunk of Python code. Does anybody have any, any questions? Yeah. What's your, what's your notebook? What, what user number are you? Uh, it should be like a user zero zero. Um, yeah, do you have your do you have your username? I can restart your notebook. It should be on your paper. It says user five. Okay, let's try this. Oops. Okay, you can try it again here in a second. Okay, any other questions on uh, the code? Okay, so let's do some functional Python. Um, how many people have done some functional programming? Anybody? Like, okay, Lisp users or Scala or something like that. So in Python, uh, there's a quote here. This is, I think this is off of Wikipedia. But Python acquired its lambda map reduce and filter from a Lisp hacker who missed them. And so we ha we've had these for quite a while in Python. And the, re the reason I want to talk about them is we're going to use them in parallelization and distributed computing quite a bit here. So here's the map abstraction. And this is, this is such a common pattern that Python actually elevated it down to syntax. So it's not just, you don't just have map, you have list comprehension, if you're familiar with that term. And so here's how it works. Let's say you have a function. So in this case, I have square x. I want to take two numbers and just multiply them together. And I have a list of numbers, which is just one, two, three in this case. And the pattern is I want to apply that square function to every single number in my list, right? So the one way I would do that is I would have a function. And I could say for x and num, I just call the square function, and I put that in some results list, and then I pass back the results list. And this happens so often in so many languages, and it's so common that there is a map function. And the map function, if we, if we do this, uh, we can see that the map function just says, I noticed, I noticed that I have a container of something, and I have a function, and I just want to apply them and get the results back. So all I have to do is say result equals map and the function I want to apply, and then the container. And that's, that's always the case with map. So that, that's the map function. I don't know what else to really say about it. Does anybody, is that, does that look too familiar or foreign, or does it feel OK? Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, I don't know if people, I, you know, I know my own, my own experience is once you see it and you use it a little bit, you're like, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I think the reason, I think the reason it's important is almost every, almost every parallel sort of for loop that you would use in Python has a map function. So learning to write your code like this means that you can parallelize it like that. Whereas if you have for loops, the other thing is map is really efficient. Um, an efficient way to do a, a kind of a for loop. So, I don't, and I don't know. I'd say I don't have a good answer for that. I would say use it and see if you like it. Um, I think I think it's a pretty cool paradigm. This one's a little weird. I'll be honest. So we're going to move on to anonymous functions. Yeah. 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 It's just a shortcut. Exactly. That's a great way to say it. And the thing you're doing is whatever function you pass it. So you're just applying the square function to every single element in numbers and then passing back the result. Uh, 
Uh, you, you always have to write the function that you want to pass, unless it's anonymous. That's right. That's just for example. Yeah. 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 And if you really want to do vector code, you're really you're probably more in NumPy. This is really just for standard Python like lists and and pairs and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's uh, let's fill those back up. Um, we'll tell you what. Let me let me fill them up uh, when we take a break, so we can keep moving. It'll take me a second to do that, uh, and we'll take a break in like twenty minutes. So, um, this isn't crucial that you're executing. I don't think. Um, okay, so map is a little weird. Let's do something even more weird. Let's do instead of always writing the function, let's just write it on the fly. Right? So we don't, we don't actually define the function. We just have an anonymous function. And that's called a lambda expression. And it's so popular, Java 8 is getting it. And they're really excited about it. So here's how it works. Um, and the, and the, I should say the reason this happens is in Python, uh, data are variables, essentially. Uh, and function, or I should say functions are data. And so you can. You can define a function as a variable, and you can pass functions to other functions, and functions can return functions. And that's a little, that is a little weird, but here's, here's what it gets you is I can say lambda x, and, and then I say x squared. So instead of doing a def square parentheses x, I just say lambda x. And it's all in one line. And so this says I have an anonymous function, x times x, and I want to apply that to every function in my range of 10. So now range 10 is kind of like my nums. So if I wanted to, I could just, just to limit how much we're doing here, I could say numbers. Um, and I've applied my map function to the numbers. Uh, if I wanted to do this in a single line, I could define numbers as the range function. So that gives me a list from 0 to 9. And then I apply this anonymous function to it. And I get my result back. And of course, I could store the result in the res list and then just print that, too. That's an anonymous function. When we talk about Spark, we're going to have to use those. We, I mean, we don't have to use them. You, you kind of want to use them, because it just makes it a lot more concise. Uh, but you don't, need this for, you don't need this for parallelism. OK, let's quickly do reduce. Uh, reduce just takes two arguments from your container and then cumulatively applies a function to them. So if you have, for example, a function that says add numbers x1, x2, and you do a reduce on that function on your numbers list, it'll just go through your numbers list and add the pairs cumulatively. And if you had subtract, it would subtract them and multiply, et cetera. So it just gives you a single value back. And of course, you could do that with a lambda expression also. So reduce, just, just think reduce always takes two values, and it will apply those consecutively. OK, filter is actually kind of a break from what we've been doing. <laughs> um, filter just says you give it a Boolean array, a, a function that gives you a Boolean value. And if it's true, it includes it in the result. And if it's false, it doesn't. So it's just a way to take a huge list of numbers and, and filter it by some criteria. And that criteria you define in your function. So that's the filter function. So for example, I can say, filter my results if they're less than 10, for example. Um, and again, if I'd like, I can swap out the less than 10 with a lambda expression. And then I don't have to define that function if I'm only using it in the one spot. OK, so I would say that those are new concepts for a lot of folks. So I would just kind of digest them and don't worry too much about making sure you understand every little bit. Um, and I think you'll see it enough today that it'll start to make sense. Uh, res is just a list that we created somewhere up here. There we did. We created res. This was 
was the value of res when we passed it in. So it's just a list and we're filtering numbers that are, in this case, less than 10. Um, so if x is greater, it's true, it keeps it. You know, it's, I just realized it's kind of a bummer is we're going to do Spark right around noon and everybody's going to be hungry and it's going to be a bunch of functional programming. <laughs> So, you know, I don't know. I'm open to skipping Spark if we're having fun with other things. Uh, let's see how it goes. So let's do, let's do sort of the hello world for data analysis in Python. And that is, let's read in the Hamlet text and count all the words and make a frequency distribution. So um, you should have Hamlet.txt in your, in your data directory. And I would just kind of skip over this next block. It just basically gives me a list of words using some regular expressions, which we don't need to talk about. And so if I take a common way to calculate how many unique things you have in a list, it's just to take the set of that, and then you can convert it back to a list. So you just take your list, which has duplicates, you take the set of it, and you convert it to a list, and bam, you've got, and then you take the length, you've got 400 or 4,086 unique words in Hamlet. So, um, Let's do a frequency. And again, this is partly for review, but here we can throw out all the words that have a length, um, length greater than two. And so I'm going to use a filter function. So I have my words list. And I say if the length of the word in that list, so x refers to an individual word in my words list, if x is, you know, greater than two, keep it, otherwise filter it out. So if I do that, I can see now, and actually let me just print some words here. You can see, whoops, print. Got that fancy new print statement. You can see I've got a bunch of words in here and I've got things like to and of in this. In fact, I can select out and just print 10 of them to make it cleaner. And then when I filter those out, I get rid of, say, of, because um, it has length too. OK, uh, the Python dictionary is, is one way we could do this. So we have a list of words. There's a lot of duplicates. We want to just store key value pairs. So if, you've, if you haven't used the Python dictionary, you should, you should learn this one for sure. It's a very popular data structure. You basically stick the word in as the key, and then you just want to increment the count every time you see it. And so uh, we could certainly do this in a map function, but let's do it in a for loop, because I think that's cleaner. Um, I initialize the dictionary. And there's a few ways you can do this. This is just one way I just say dict with parentheses. So I have an empty dictionary. That's what D is. Um, and I can even print D here, just so you can see it. Um, and then what I do is for every word in, in my dictionary, I go in and I use this really helpful function called get. It's a dictionary method. And I take my current dictionary and I get the word. And if it's not there, I get the, I get the, I get the value of the word. And if it's not there, I return 0. So what I can do is I can just walk through these words and add 1 to the value with the get method. So in other words, the first time I, I haven't seen the word, I assign it the value of 0 because it wasn't there. The second time around, I get that value, and it's now 1. So I just add 1 to it, and I have 2, et cetera. So you don't have to use the get method, but if you didn't use the get method, you'd have some if statements. Like if this word's not in the dictionary, then assign it the value 0. Else, get the value and add 1 to it kind of thing. So get kind of wraps that up. So. Um, there's our empty dictionary, and then we just filled it with the for loop. And good. Uh, let's let's just look inside that really quick. So now I can say something like for k in d keys, and I'm only going to look at the first few keys because otherwise things will get. I'll print. I'll print the key and the value of the key. Right, that's the key in the dictionary value for the first 10. And so uh, you can see that we just have a word and values and counts going. 
Okay. Um, I'm just going to skip over this next block. It's kind of how you'd sort a dictionary, and I think I think it's just going to be kind of horrendous. But basically, what this does is just says, "Hey, sort my dictionary and return some tuples for me, word and counts." And then, of course, I can wrangle them with a map function. So right now, I have them as a list of pairs, but I can't plot that. I need them as lists of values. So I can use a map function to grab those, or I could do the, the beloved list comprehension in Python. And again, just so we can get going, I'm going to skip over that a little bit. But feel free to ask me questions at lunch if you'd like. Here's a little utility for plotting these then. And so, you know, with not too many lines of code, we took the, the book of Hamlet and we counted the word frequency, we threw out small words, and then we can say, oh, look at, you know, Hamlet's is popular or more popular than the word that. So we see the word, you know, we hear the word Hamlet as, at least as much as we hear the word that or it or is. Okay. So the point here is that we had this we have this process of taking raw data and and processing it and that could be very large it could be very large data and it could be very large scientific data and we did some wrangling we might want to do some exploring um, some visualization and there's a lot of ways to do that and I think I think Python with the notebook is an, is a really excellent way to sort of interact with your data and there's so many new tools that we'll talk about after the break. Um, hopefully it'll inspire you to sort of connect a little bit more with the notebook. So, Okay, here's my proposal. It's 11.22. How about we take, does it, do you guys want a break or we just we want to just fix some notebooks and get going? Or How about, how many people would like a break? Just raise your hand. I'm with you. Let's keep going. Um, okay, who's got notebook issues? Okay, hang on just a second. So I'm going to I'm going to do this. I'm going to restart everybody's notebook and copy the data into everybody's folder again, okay? So you're going to get kicked out of your notebooks, but it's easier that way. Here they go. Oh, I maybe shouldn't have done that. That's a lot of, let's see, that's going to take a minute. Well. Okay, I'm going to stop that. Okay, who's got, just yell out usernames for me, or user numbers if you've got 011. Okay. Okay, and you are there, and what was yours? Five? And what was yours? Okay. Okay, anybody else? Three nine? Okay. Anybody else? Two? Okay. Okay. So these notebooks are pretty stable. <laughs> Anybody else have? Okay. Yeah, you'll have to re-accept this. It generates a new certificate, so you have to say, yep, give me the certificate. Okay, and I need to copy some data over really quick, so let me do that. Okay. Yeah, it'll just it just kicks you out completely, um, and then you'll have to accept a new certificate. Cost associated with it. Yeah, there's a cost. It costs uh, so I have about forty nodes running and. They're large nodes. They each have four cores, and it's about ten bucks an hour. So, yeah. Oh. Okay. Needs a needs a reboot. Uh, it should work on Firefox. Is it an older version of Firefox? Oh, you might have to clear your cache. Oh, okay. <laughs> Try clearing your cache and seeing if that works. 
Okay. Oops. Restart. Okay. Hopefully that works. If it doesn't, I think I have a few other uh, instances. Maybe you should just try a different instance. Let's do that. Anybody having uh, extreme malfunctions with their notebooks? I'm going to try a new one. OK. I'm going to give you guys one at least. It's just broken. I'll, sw I'll swap with you. Yep, and then your. Yep, yeah, password. Yeah, the password's RC, and then the username. Made it. That one, I'll I'll restart it. Okay, and it's totally possible this notebook is just going to bomb, and this might just be a demo. <laughs> um, how is it? Is anybody having success with their notebooks? OK, so some people's working, some it's not. OK, I apologize for those that it's not working. You know, I woke up this morning. And I was like, I'm going to do something really simple. I'm going to fire up a cluster on Amazon and launch a bunch of notebooks with users and copy some, some folders around. You'd think that would be easy. <laughs> so, uh, do you want to do new? I want to try a new notebook. Yeah, yours is, yeah, it looks good. OK, let's go do some pandas. And how, you guys OK? Is it rolling? Yeah. Might have to type in it again. I'm going to leave the three remaining ones up there. And if you want to swap out, just put your old one here, and I'll restart it. Oh, OK. Still good? OK. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. If it's not, you can do the swap out trick. OK. So I admit the, the functional thing was a little weird, and let's something a little less weird. So I'm going to do this pandas library. So that's number three. Um, you can just click on it to fire it up. And I'll make it a little bigger in case you want to just watch. So what did pandas bring to Python? It's You can think Excel spreadsheet. Um, and it gives, you, it gives you basically a table in memory that's a lot like a spreadsheet. And it's incredibly efficient. So it's, it's a lot like an R data frame. There's a lot of other languages that are trying to duplicate the data frame type thing. It's built on top of NumPy. And Wes McKinney, the author of the code, is he's very conscious of, of speed. So he does a bunch of speed tests. Uh, and it's had a huge growth recently. And it's great for medium data. And when I say medium, um, I've killed Janus nodes that have 20 gigabytes running and gone up to a high mem node with 100. And pandas is just fine. It works great. So I, I don't know where the threshold is past 100 gigs, but you know, for that size data set, it's totally appropriate. Um, I put some resources on here. There's, there's some great videos online for pandas if you want to watch them later just to get more familiar with it. And I would say this is one of the, this is one of the Python libraries that you just have to commit to using a little bit, because it's a lot of syntax, and it's a little different. And I think if you just you know, try to do your workflow over and over again, you'll get it. The other thing you can do, which is a little nerdy, but just consider it, is set aside some time in the morning and just do the same pandas code over and over again. It's kind of like a karate kata. You know, like you're, just pra you're just practicing useless moves by yourself. And if you do that, you'll, 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 you'll be really quick with pandas. So you can consider that. This could be your first kata, for example. Let's see. I'm going to skip some of that. So here's, here's an outline we're going to shoot for. We want to just reshape our data a little bit. Pandas is great at reshaping. Um, so 
we'll talk about what that means. If we have time and there's interest, this might be a, a group choice where we do more pandas and less functional programming. We might do this movies example where we could do some group by and some joining. And this is a lot more like database for spreadsheet kind of work, where we can take two tables that have keys, join them together. Pandas does a great job of that. And then we can group by and summarize in different ways. And uh, the, the example there is, is kind of fun. So here's, let's just get started. This is, this is modified version of uh, a link I put here, which is, I think, a video. Yeah, so if you want to watch this data wrangling kung fu with pandas, you certainly can. Um, I'm going to skip the first couple of uh, lines. I don't, they're not really important to talk about, other than just creating some data to play with. So here's what our data looks like. It's a bunch of dates on column one. And then we have some models. I think we have A, B, C. And then we have some value for the model. Right? And this is kind of a stacked format. And the idea is, first off, we just want to read that into a data frame. So pandas has a great method called read underscore CSV. And we just pass it our CSV file. And I'm going to store it in the variable DF. And I'm going to print DF. And you can see what we get. We get a column on the far left side, which is an index. And we can set that index if we want. And then we have three columns. We have a date, a type, and a value. So what we want to do is manipulate these columns a little bit to see, kind of see what we get. So we want to sort of want to reshape this table with pandas. Yeah. Oh, yes. Good. So the only thing you need to do is you can either hit, the, hit this play button, which is just run cell, if you want to do that. Or I like to do shift enter. I just hold down the shift key and hit enter, and it will also run that command. OK, so uh, who's got some thoughts on why you might store your data this way? Anybody? You've got some models, you've got some dates, you've got some values. And maybe ultimately what you want to do is see like a comparison of models, right? The one, one reason this is popular is you may not know how many models you're actually going to have. It kind of seems silly for this example, but uh, I was helping somebody recently with a project at work, and they said, I think I've got 200 different columns, and I want to reshape this into columns. And when we reshaped it, it was like 2080. And I was like, does that, does that sound about right? And he's like, oh, I didn't realize I had that many. So, so this is a great format. If you don't know ahead of time how many columns you're going to have, you just store it in this format. And then you reshape it with pandas and get exactly what you need. So uh, the, other, the other reason is maybe you want to have more than one metric associated with each model. So then you just have a duplicate row or something. So you could say, you know, this one I have the bottom row. It's model C7. But that could be model C, my value type 7. And the next row could be model C, my other value type 20 or something. And it's a very compact. Uh, robust way to sort of gather data, and then you can you can reshape it later if you'd like. So here's the idea. This is it's called pivot. It's very much like a pivot table in Excel, and I think once you see it, you'll get it. But what I'm going to do is I call I take my data frame, which the variable name is df, and I call pivot, and I I say I give it a row, a column, and a value. So I, I want the rows to be the date of my new table. I want the columns to be the type, which is the models. So models will be across the top. And I want my values to be kind of what's in the actual table. And so if I do that, um, it's going to take a second. More than a second. There we go. I just had to do it again. Uh, you can see what we got, right? We have a new representation of that data table uh, in a way that maybe we, we wanted to see it originally when we gathered the data, but it wasn't efficient to gather, gather it that way. And then in pandas, you know, if you want to see things like what are the what are the titles of my columns, you can get um, you get a list back with columns, or you could get a list back with 
the index, which in this case is the date. And there's some, you know, if we want to access certain things, we can. We can say, give me the results of a specific column. So we just give it the column name, and it will give us just that column of data, which is kind of handy. Uh, if we wanted just the actual values in that column without the attached date index, we can just say uh, the results with the column name and then dot values, and it will just give you a, uh, an array of the values without the index included. Okay, um, for rows, you can access, there's a, there's a few different methods, and the one I remember is this IX method. So we can't access rows with a name because uh, we're using that for columns. So uh, Wes had to provide a method, and the method is IX. And so you can say IX0, and it gives you the, f the first row. Um, you can also say IX and give it the, the name of the index, which in this case is a date string. Um, it's, real, it's a string with a date in it, I should say. It's not a date time object. Um, and that will also give you the same, same uh, row as well. So, there's, so you can kind of get to, you can get to rows or columns with indices, like zeros, ones, or you can get to them by name if you'd like. Uh, you can also, this is kind of NumPy-like, but you can say, I want the, the third, fourth and fifth row, and I just want from columns one on, and it would give you a, a smaller subsidiary table. So I'm slicing into my table in a very specific way. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different ways to sort of look at sort of statistics. So I can say mean or sum or count. And just like in NumPy where you specify an axis of zero or one, you can do the same thing with pandas, and it has the same interpretation. So here I took, I took the mean of all the rows. So I you know, averaged the rows with axes equals 1. Here I'm counting how many things I have in each column. So now I've got columns with a count of the number of items. So now let's, let's create a new data frame. And you, you can kind of glaze over this step if you'd like not that important. But I'm creating a data frame from a dictionary, a Python dictionary, that looks like this. And now I'm going to add it to my, and I just want to put that on my original data frame. So I'm just going to use the concat method and put it right on the bottom. So now instead of, and I can use the df shape, so I can look at the shape of my data frame. Instead of having 12 items, I now have 14. So I, my assumption is it went well. And let's, uh, you know, we could, we could drop, say, row two if we wanted. Uh, and we do that with axes equals zero here. Uh, the head command also is handy. There's a head and a tail command. And it just lets you peek at the top or the bottom of your data frame. So that's useful. And we can drop. Also drop a column if we wanted to. Yeah, that's a great segue. So the question is, you know, so far we've been working with with data where everything's present, right? So let's throw, let's do some missing data. So if I take my my now my 14 rows and I reshape them again, I am going to miss some data, right? Because I left off, um, I only added two in there. And so, so here's the missing data thing. We reshape with the pivot, and we get these NAs. And the way Pandas handles this is brilliant. It just, I mean, I think it is. You can, you can still take the mean and the count. And unlike NumPy, it doesn't just blow up on you, right? So it just says, I'll just skip it. Uh, and if you want to find those missing values, there's two handy methods. One is isNull, and one is fillNA. And so you can see if you have any null values. And if you want to fill them, you can. So here's, you know, isNull gives me a Boolean matrix, basically, that says, yep, I've got two missing values. And if I want to just fill those missing values with 0, I can also do that. 
It automatically did that for me, yeah. yeah. The other thing that's kind of nice, and I don't have a demo of this, but if you, had, if you were merging two data sets together and, and one of the columns had a bunch of missing data because it didn't have values, you can choose to fill that linearly. You can choose it to fill forward, fill backward, fill it with zeros. I mean, it's very handy for that kind of work. Yeah. I can see that everybody's probably thinking of scenarios where they can use this. So I don't know, maybe at lunch we can have a special, special group for that, talk about the scenarios. Um, let's see. So one thing you'll notice is when, when we do this reshape, we get an in, our index is now the date string. And to be clear, this is just a string. It's not a date time object. So one thing that's really handy is, uh, and, it, and with pandas, if, if I wanted to actually make a copy of this table, I actually have to say results.copy. Otherwise, I'm getting a view of it. And changes I make to the view will persist in the original one. So this is a lot like NumPy in a sense. Um, so here I filled NA with 0, and I added this in place equals true. And this actually gets me a lot. So if you don't, if you don't include the in place equals true keyword, it, it actually fills the values with 0, but it doesn't do it to the, to the original set, and it returns a copy of it. And the copy, in this case, is just nowhere. I didn't assign it to anything. So if I, you know, it's, it's quite common that you might say temp fill NA 0 and not assign it back to temp, and it doesn't work. So you can do, basically what I'm saying is you can do this, or have to do something like this, where you have temp over here. So those are equivalent. One, it does it in place. The other one makes a copy of it and overwrites the original value. Yeah. Yeah. And in place isn't available for everything. So sometimes you have to just look in the documentation to see if you can do it. Yeah. Um, so here's, I use reset index a fair bit too. If you do some sort of reshape or group by, it might give you an index. And if you want to reset that index, you certainly can. And so let's see what happens here. So here I called reset index and I did an in place equals true. So that would do it to the original copy. And now you can see that my new index is just, z is just integers, and my date string is actually a column. Andy, you can, um, there's an as matrix command, which will go to uh, a NumPy array, basically, a two dimensional NumPy array. So this is. This is quite handy if you're cleaning up data with pandas and then you want to pass it to scikit-learn, for example. Scikit-learn wants to have a NumPy array, two-dimensional array. Um, and so you can clean it up and, and pass it around. See, I think so. the opposite of pivot is melt. And that's just a term taken from R. So if we wanted to take our pivoted data and just melt it back into a stacked format, we could do that. And so here I'm just taking, I'm storing the pivot as the results variable. Then I'm going to reset the index and melt it back where I pass the ID bars of date. Um, and so we get kind of the original, we get the original. So we can kind of pivot and melt all we want. The other thing I'll say about pivot and melting is uh, pivot only works if you don't have duplicate data, or that you, don't, you wouldn't have to sum data. If you want to do some sort of pivot with a group by, it's, it's a different method. It's called pivot table. And we'll, we'll do an example of that in a second, I think. OK. Um, you, can, you, can write, you can write values to files very easily. It's just called 2CSV. You can either include the index or not. I usually don't include the index if it's an auto-generated one. And that's kind of a, that's like a very, very short introduction to pandas. It writes it in the directory where the notebook's running. So yeah, so if you, 
And you know, if you want to see it, you can kind of come in here. Let me actually just write it. One thing that's nice about these notebooks is you can just do some, you can just do some Linux commands with a bang. So I say exclamation point ls, and I can see what's in the directory. And here's, uh, here's the file that I just wrote. So it's just in the same directory as my notebook. OK. Um, so it's 11.45. I, we, don't, oh, we just don't have time for it all. And so let's go to, we're going to have to do some group voting, which it's, we're just going to, have, it's going to have to be yes, no kind of thing. So there's really, there's really three more things that I think would be awesome to talk about. And I think they each take more than 15 minutes. And it's going to be lunchtime soon, and people are going to lose interest. So uh, here's some options. We can do more pandas. Uh, the pandas is, is kind of fun. We'll do some group buys and we'll figure out the best movie for date night. So if you haven't seen that one, it's, it's an interesting way to use pandas to increase your social status. So that's one option. And I'm not pushing any of these. Um, the other thing we can do is we can look at uh, parallel Python. And I think you get to pick two. So the vote is going to be which one don't you want to see. I think is how we're going to do it. So pick two. The second topic is parallel Python. I'll just show you some really quick and easy ways to parallelize your code once you have it in the map format. Um, so this is, you know, and this has been successful at CU, you know, running thousands and thousands of simulations on hundreds of cores. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. And one of the examples is a machine learning classification example I took from Scikit-Learn. So that's an option. That's option two. So option one, date night. Option two, parallel with some machine learning. Option three. This, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I think I think we I think we really only have time for two. I I mean I'm all for trying to cram them all. So the so the option we vote out we'll just smash in at the end if we have time. The third option is Spark, and it's a very functional paradigm, but it's sort of the only thing in Python that lets you do really massive data sets. So we'll talk about MapReduce if you've heard that term, and we'll do some some very simple examples in the Spark framework. And just so you know, Spark is, you know, I've recently run, you know, a few hundred gigabytes on Janus interactively over 40 nodes with Spark. So it's a very, very cool framework. It's not something you can download and just go play with on your local machine because it's not really built for that. It's a cluster tool. So you have to have your favorite cluster folks install it and give you access to it. OK, so that's the three. I'm, I'm just going to, what's that? Yes, please. Yeah, first option is more pandas, and it's date night with movie. Yeah. Um, pandas is like the R data frame. So R is a statistics language. And yeah. Yeah, it would be a different library. And so there's sort of, if you wanted to emulate R in Python, you would have Python plus pandas for the data structure, plus scikit-learn for the machine learning, plus stats models for the statistics, um, plus matplotlib for the plotting, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's just getting you the data structure. And it gets you, you can summarize and count, um, you know, put different buckets. But it doesn't give you, you know, linear regression. It doesn't give you principal components. That's scikit-learn, so. All right, so who wants, to, who wants to analyze some movies with pandas? Oh, wait, no, we're, I'm sorry. We're voting for the one we don't want. All right, how many people don't care about pandas anymore? You've had enough. OK, fair enough. I want to hold that against you. Yeah. OK, that might, come at the end. Uh, that might come at the end. How many people don't care about parallel Python? Oh, that breaks my heart to ask it that way. OK, how many people could care less about Spark? Oh, oh OK. 
Just give me a minute. I'll digest that one. OK, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go really fast so we can get it all done. I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, um, fair enough. OK, let me just. OK, let me just say this about Spark. Just keep it in your mind that when you have massive amounts of data that you want to analyze and you don't know how to do it and you don't want to bust out MPI for pi and try to fiddle with you know, who gets the data where, then just know that Spark is ready when you are. OK. OK, movie night. This is actually fun. This is a good break. We've, we've been kind of getting in some intense pandas with fake examples. And now we can do something with some real data. Uh, all the credit goes to Wes McKinney. His Python for Data Analysis book is fantastic, if you want to learn more about it. Uh, and the, here's the question. We have, this, we have this rankings data set of male and female, and movies, and rankings. And we want to know, what's the best movie for a date night? right? Because it's true that men and women have slightly different tastes in movies, as we'll see. So what we're really trying to do is pick a movie that everybody's going to enjoy. And by everybody, I mean male and female. So, so let's do this. Let's read in the data. So this is an ugly set of, uh, an ugly function in a way. But it's because the movie data, it's three files. And it's not comma separated. It's not tab separated. It's double colon separated. And I've never seen a double colon separated file before this. But it makes sense because you might have a tab in the movie. You might have a comma in the title. You know, and you don't want to accidentally split on that. So why not pick two characters you never see together? Hence, I think, the double colon. The other thing is this, these files don't have a header in them. So I'm reading in the table. I'm passing it how I want to separate it. And I'm saying header equals none, but use the names I give you. And I just put the names as a, as a Python list above the, the read call. So all that to say, I, I'm going to just read these in. Uh, if you haven't seen this notation before, this is called Python unpacking. And it's where if you give back three things, you can just assign them to three things. Uh, it's a very popular way to do it in Python. OK, so I've read the data. And I can just look at um, my users, for example, my ratings, and my movies. And what I want to do is I, I kind of notice that, well, I have users have users IDs. And then in the ratings, each user can rate multiple movies. So they have a user ID as well. And I want to merge those together. And obviously, Pandas is going to fill in the missing values, right? Because these are different size tables. Users is smaller. And ratings is much larger. And then the same thing goes for movies. My ratings has a movie ID. And that links to a table with IDs. And that's going to have you know, one ID for every single movie. And what I'd like to do is, is just link all those together. So I have one huge table with all the information. And then I can just apply pandas. So I'm going to skip this little bit of code. This is what I call Perl Python, um, in that it looks like Perl. <laughs> uh, and when, meaning when you come back to it in a month, you don't even know what you did. Um, so I'm going to skip that. I'm glad some of you found that funny. <laughs> um, if you haven't used Perl, it's, I, I mean, I tried for a while, and it was hard. So here's the cool part about pandas. There's a merge method on the data frame. And I, just, I can just give it the data frames. And in most cases, it does the right thing if the column headers are, the, are correct. So first thing I do is I say, merge ratings and users. And don't create a data frame for that. Just take the result and then merge that with movies. So I've got this kind of nested merge going on here. And when I do that, there it's done. And in fact, I can see, I'm going to look at the shape of this thing. I've got a million some rows with 12 columns now. So I've got all the columns, and I've got all the rows. And, it, and you'll just have to trust me, but it did it correctly. So this is um, be very difficult to do if you didn't have pandas in Python. Leave it at that. Let's see what kind of columns we have here. We've got you know, all the columns we hope to have. Movie ID, rating ID, user ID, uh, and a bunch of other things. And what I want to do is just, is just select out a few columns to work with. So I don't want all the columns. Um, I want the short title, and I want the rating. And so I'm just going to grab 
those two values, and I'm going to create a new table called temp. Right? So here I've got the short title and the rating. And notice I've got multiple movies in there because I have multiple users. Right? So now what I'd like to do is ask some simple questions like, what's the average rating per movie? Right? So I take all the movies, and I group by title. And when I do that group by operation, I just want to take the mean of the ratings. So that's a, that's a pretty straightforward thing to do. And in pandas, there's a group by method. And I'm going to print the result there just to make this clear. So in pandas, when you say group by and you pass it a column name, it creates a group by object. And that group by object is actually a list of data frames. So we can apply things to those data frames if we'd like. So in this case, I'm going to do I'm going to take my group and just apply a mean to it. So I've got everything grouped by titles. I walk through each of my group, my data frames in that, that, ha that share the same group. And I just take the mean of the column, which in this case is just ratings. And so now I'll get a data frame with, and I'll describe it here, um, the head. Now I've got a data frame that has one movie on each row and the average of the rating. Right? And that's what I wanted. So we're, we're getting close. Uh, and now I just need to say, well, I really just want to see which one's the highest rated. So I need to sort this new data frame uh, called mean rating. So here we go. We can use a sort method. And that's pretty straightforward. I take my data frame. I call the sort method. And I pass it the column I want to sort on. And then I can say ascending, true, or false, depending on how I want it sorted. And then I'm just going to look at the top 10. So, th so this line here, I'm going to roll this up a little bit, is going to give me the 10 highest rated movies that if you haven't seen, you should go watch, right? So there they are. Let's make them make sure they're big. So there's the highest rated movies. They all got average rating of 5. And if you haven't seen them, I bet they're incredible. Let's walk through them really quick. There's Bittersweet Motel. I haven't seen that one. Actually, yeah. <laughs> right? So how many people have seen at least one of these, right? So there, yeah. So the, what's the problem, really? This, that? Yeah, yeah. We've got a couple big fans, right? So, so we need to do some filtering on our movies, and so let's go back to our rating. And instead of taking just the mean of the rating, let's take the count of the rating too, right? So we can get a mean and how many there were. And then we'll be able to filter with that. So here I'm going to do that again. I'm going to group by the rating. But instead of just taking the mean, I'm going to use the ag method and grab the mean and the count. And I, could, I, mean, I, can, I can add you know, identifiers to this list all, you know, all I want. In this case, I just have two. And now I'm going to sort it and look at the head again. I get the same list. And yes, I can see that. Smashing Time actually had two five-star ratings. And uh, Gate of Heavenly Peace had three, but everybody else just had a single. And so we want to, you know, ideally we want to throw out the, the low-counted items. So again, pretty easy to do in Pandas. Here I can say, I'm going to grab my mean rating, and I'm going to grab the count column. And I'm going to say, if the count is greater than 1,000, put that in a variable mask. So mask. And here, I think I've got some. Mask is a panda series. It's got 210 items that were greater than 1,000 in it. Um, and you can see that uh, what it looks like, if I just look at the top of my mask, is it has my index, short title, and a true-false value. So for example, a million ducks did not have 1,000 ratings. Neither did Night Mother. Um, now, we might want to double check these results. <laughs> OK. So, um, so now what I can do is I can apply the mask to my IX method. So remember, IX help, lets me select out rows. So I'm saying, just give me the rows that have greater than 1,000 ratings. And when I do that, I can see that I have you know, Space Odyssey had 1,700 ratings. And I have mean. So now I'm ready to do what I came to do, right? I want to sort these and see. Um, that's just a double check. 
here's the highest rated movies with at least 1,000 votes. So suspenseful. Here it is. Ready? Okay. There we go. Okay, so this makes more sense, right? Um, Shawshank Redemption had 2,227 votes, and it was the highest average rated movie with 4.55 stars. Um, okay, so that's, I mean, that's a pretty basic operation that you might, you can, might, might imagine doing to your own data set, where you filter, you do some summing, some group buys, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I've run into this. I, I actually stumbled upon pandas when I was trying to solve a problem on our supercomputer. We've got like 1,300 nodes, and it's collecting node data, and I wanted to group by node and then pivot a column. And I was actually trying to do it in a dictionary for a while, and, uh, and that gets to be really tedious. So I went looking for pandas a few years ago, and you know, to say it's changed my life is strong, but it's been a great addition to my tool set. <laughs> OK, so now uh, let's say, so we've done this. Let's do, yeah, we're in good shape. We're going to do a few more minutes on pandas, and then we're going to do some parallel and probably squeak in Spark at the end if we have time. Um, let's, look at, let's look at movies by gender to see which ones we like the most uh, by gender. And that will allow us to use a different kind of pivot table. So, so I mentioned when we use pivot, uh, it's great for just reshaping a table, but what we want to do is we want to have movies, and then we want to have on the columns we want to have mean rating by gender, right? So we want two columns now, and so when we pivot that, we actually need to do some some group by operations as well, and you could do this as a group by step, and then a pivot if you want, but pandas gives you a helper function called pivot table that does it kind of in one one line. So I take my original data set, PD, that's right here. I apply the pivot table method, and I say, here's, here's what I want to do. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. PD is the name of the library. Data is my original data set. There it is. I want to do, I want to pivot on rating. So rating is going to go inside my new table. My rows are going to be the title. My columns are going to be the gender. And I have to provide it an aggregate function because it, because it can't just pivot without aggregating some values, right? We've got too many movies that we're going to group by. So I can give it the mean. And when I do that, I'm just going to look at the first few rows. I get my title, and then I get my gender columns, right? So it did a pivot and a sum for me. Um, if you can't remember, which, like me, sort of the, what pivot table takes, you can always just type the name of the method in the notebook with a question mark, and it'll take you right to the documentation to figure out without going to Google. And it, there we go. Come on. OK, so now that we have that, um, we, can take, uh, we can sort by these different columns, right? So here I'm going to take the mean rating, sort by male, and look at the top 10. <laughs> um, that's not quite right. Here we go. Um, I haven't applied the mask yet. So these, these ratings had movies that only had a single count, right? And so let's, what I'm doing here is I'm saying re identify mean ratings to be just the movies that actually had more than 1,000 ratings. So it takes my, my table with male and female columns and it just selects the rows for those movies which had 1,000. OK, and then when I sort by mail, I can see that we like things like The Godfather and Raiders of the Lost Ark and things that you might suspect. And if I sort by female, uh, we you know, have, a different, have a different list. Uh, but there's some commonalities, right? Like you can see Shawshank Redemption's in there. Um, and usual suspects shared by both. And so we could keep going with this, but we only have 25 minutes left. Um, so you know, here's, I'm going to show you one more panda trick that's really cool. Let's say we want to create a new column that shows the difference in ratings. So it takes those columns and just subtracts the male and female values. It's very easy to do. We just, 
basically write it down. We say mean difference of our diff, and then we pass. I'm going to do the absolute value in this sense. And so now we can see which movies we disagree on the most and agree on the most. So here's, uh, for example, the ones where men tend to like them quite a bit more than women. And that would be uh, Animal House. Uh, this is where we, I guess we differ the most. So Mary Poppins, a little bit more popular with women. Reservoir Dogs, more popular with men. <laughs> and let's look at... Um, Here's agreement. So we all like Jerry Maguire about the same, which isn't to say that we liked it. Um, uh, Goodwill Hunting, notice that's actually a pretty high, highly rated movie that we agreed on. So here was the idea of date night is why not take this? And again, you, you, know, you can do this kind of in private. You don't have to share this. Um, you, you take this list and you say, I'm going to look for the highest rated movies that are most similar. And then that's the one I'm going to rent, right? And just in the interest of time, I'm just going to roll through it to the answer because, man, I'm psyched to get to parallel computing. But you could do things like, well, let's look at the distribution of, of differences and just pick movies that are very similar. So I might say, here my threshold's 0.1 on the difference, right? And then I could look at the ratings and say, uh, let's pick highly rated movies like something above you know, 0.425. So here's. Here's the masks I applied in pandas fairly quickly and easily. And go. Um, so highest rated movies with the least amount of difference, North by Northwest, Rear Window, Unusual Suspects, and Shawshank Redemption. So there's your, your practical take home list today. It's not quite Friday, but you, you'll be ready when it is. So uh, that's pandas. Let's. Let's stop there. Any, any questions about what we did in pandas? There's, there's actually so much to pandas, it's, you could spend a day or two on it. There's time series. Uh, there's multi-hierarchical indexing on rows and columns, which is very useful. Um, so anyway, I hope that at least gets you excited to, to check it out. All right, I am going to, for the next section, you can run the parallel examples in your notebook. I'm going to switch over to Janus because I get more cores per node. And I think that's nice. So if you want to run, and I'm actually going to spark. I'm going to fire up a Spark notebook just in case. And this is kind of just to show you that to, to launch remote notebooks, once you have it automated, is, is just a, a script on your command line. So this. For example, would log me into Janus and fire up a notebook and create a tunnel for me so I don't have to do that every time. And having this available uh, look more likely. <laughs> um, so let's give this a second. If you do have a, if you, you know, I know a lot of you guys use the Beach Cluster. Um, if you want some help getting this working, uh, happy to do that. Uh, just come chat with me. OK, so I've got a notebook running. And I've tunneled it back to localhost 999. So I'm going to go to that localhost. And now I'm on Janus. And go to, I've already cloned this repository over here. I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go to the parallel example. So when you run these, it'll look different because you have four cores on your nodes. And Janus has 12. And of course, this applies to, you know, if I wanted to use multiple nodes, we could do that. OK, so kind of the, this is kind of the quick and impatient way to do it. Uh, you just want to see some parallel code in action. So the first function I have is called work. And uh, you can imagine this being something much greater, like running your simulation or you know, doing some, something that matters. This just sleeps for x amount of seconds. And it records a start and end time, and then returns the process ID that ran the work function and the amount of time it slept, basically, start and end time. So it's just, a, it's just a function so we can see what's going on. And I don't have anything really real to do. Um, now I'm going to create, so I have a function. Now I'm going to create a list of job times. So here I'm creating, I'm going to say sleep for 0.1 to 0.3 seconds. I'm not sleeping very long. That's because I just want to show 
the parallel capability not really you know, do something realistic. In reality, you, you might be running things that take minutes to hours, and you want to parallelize those. Um, so I'm going to create 50 of those things. And I'm going to do just the serial map. So we've already seen this. But just one more time, what I'm doing is I'm saying, here's my job times. I want to apply this to my work function and then return the results. So I'm just using a map. And if you set your code up this way, you'll see it's very easy to parallelize. So this is going to take a while because I'm doing it in order. I'm just walking through my array, sleeping, and there it's done. So that took a little while. So there's the multiprocessing library is built into standard Python. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to install anything. And it's, it's like five changes, and you're running in parallel. So here's the changes. I import the library. So I import multiprocessing. And in this case, I, I grab the CPU count, and I just print it out. And, and it's going to say it's 12 because I'm on Janus. And actually, let me clear these cells because it's more exciting when you don't see the answer. OK. So I've got 12 cores, right? And then I create a pool of workers. That's, that's really multiprocessing's syntax, I guess. Um, so I create a pool of workers. And then the only change I have to make to my code, my actual code, is I just put a pool dot in front of my map function. Right? And if I do that, it's smart enough to know that, hey, I've got a pool of workers I want to map these independent tasks on. So spread them out and let them do the work and give me the result back. And I'm, I'm done before I know it. Right? And we'll look at what that we'll do. I have a plot in a few minutes. And you can actually see what, it's, what it looks like when it's running that. The other, the other option is uh, IPython Parallel. And the advantage, I think, is that it's really it's either hard or impossible to get multiprocessing to work across nodes. And I say hard because I, I, haven't, I haven't verified that it doesn't work. I've heard people doing it. I just haven't been able to do it. So I tend to use multiprocessing when I'm on one big node, and I just want to quickly parallelize something and I don't want to you know, think about it. But if you have multiple nodes and you want to use cores across multiple nodes, that's when you might want to use IPython parallel. So the way that works is much like the pool, you kind of create um, a client uh, that attaches to your workers running remotely. So if I do this, I get an error. And that's OK, because I haven't started, I haven't started the workers yet. So multiprocessing launches the workers for me automatically, kind of behind the scenes. I Python parallel. I need to do it myself. And so I just go to my notebook, and I go to the clusters tab. And you can do this if you'd like to. And you're going to be running in the default um, profile. In fact, you probably only have one profile. You can obviously create more. I'm going to start 12 workers, because I know I have 12 cores. Um, Start four workers if you want to. If you want to try this. Now that I've started the workers, I can go back to my notebook. And and I pass that client stage because it has launched a controller and some workers, and I can attach to that to that set of processes. Um, just like a pool of workers, I I can look to see how many IDs I have on my client, and it tells me I have twelve. More steps involved, but run across many nodes. So now, instead of, I guess this is sort of the load balance view. There's a couple different views with IPython. The load balance view, and I just, I just create a, a, a link to the load balance view, and then again, I make a couple small changes to my map command. So instead of calling map. I call load balance view dot map. And the, one of the differences is Python is an asynchronous result. So if you so results will be uh, an asynchronous list. So all that really means, if you want to use it, is just put a dot get method at the end of your map call. And it will return the list um, to you. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. OK. And this broke. Um, and it says times not defined. So if you use IPython parallel, you have to do a few other things to ensure that uh, the workers 
which are running the, which in this case are running the work function, can actually see all the modules. So I'm going to scroll up for a second and just show you that uh, the worker gets this work method, but it doesn't get the imports. So I have a couple options. I can move those import statements into the work function, and it will, and it will then be able to see those modules. Or I can do something like this, where I take uh, a direct view of my client, which means I have access to every single engine, and I can use this sync imports command. And I import time and OS, which are needed by my work function, uh, onto each engine. And then once I do that, I can, I can run my code, and it's done. So again, this is kind of a lot of information, but the goal isn't really to, to take one tool back. The goal is to get like a preview of all the cool things happening with Python. And then for everybody, it might be different, the, the things you explore to apply to your workflow, is at least what I'm hoping. So I realize that there's a lot of details in some of, this, some of these commands. Um, partly I hope that, one, these notes will be online for at least for as long as I'm at CU. <laughs> and um, so you can go back and look at them um, if you run into similar problems. And, th and I think those are two of the main problems you'll see with IPython Parallel. Oh, so if you go to the bottom web address um, and you just type in one HTTP instead of two, yeah, that will take you to this page um, here. And uh, the top is the stuff that we're going over and some of the stuff that we probably didn't have time to go over. Um, so you can read through those if you'd like. There's also a notebooks link right down. Let me just blow this up. Um, if you go here, if you click on the notebooks link, it goes to the repository where all the code is. And you can just download these um, and run them locally if you'd like, or however you want to do it. And then there's also a link to the, uh, the meetup group, and I'll just do that now. Um, all these examples have come from things that uh, we do at CU on a sort of weekly basis during the semester. So if you want to, if you want to run NumPy or, or Matplotlib or learn more about any of this stuff, you could go here and explore it if you'd like. Okay, so let's do a little bit more. Uh, let's just look to see what this map function really looks like in parallel. So I'm going to load all utility. And here I'm going to go back to my pool of workers. So this is the multiprocessing example. And I'm going to map my job times onto the work function. And then I'll, what I get back is a dictionary for each, for each item in my work times. And then I can compute sort of when that started, when it stopped. And I can create a plot of that sort of see what it looks like. And so it's going to run, and there we go. So you can see that I have these boxes are varying degrees because I started with random work times between 0.1 and 3. And you can see that I've done a, or not that I have, but multiprocessing has done a good job of packing uh, the jobs on and spreading them out over my resource. And this applies. Um, you know, 12 on Janus, and you might see four, four rows if you're running it on Amazon. OK, and then we can do the same thing for multiprocessing. I'm sorry, for IPython parallel. And again, it does a very similar thing, where it, where it just sort of packs each job across the resource. Yeah. Um, so that's an excellent question. And I don't know the answer in terms of multiprocessing, but it's a good segue to this link at the bottom. And um, so there's different schedules, which I think kind of gets at your question. Um, there's different ways you can schedule. If you have a bunch of resources, you don't know how long they're going to take. But you could say, for example, take the total amount of work and hand a portion to each core and just let them sort of do the work. Or if you think there's a large degree of variation, you might hand one out at a time 
and then when, when they are finished, you give them another one to do, and that's more of a dynamic schedule. And so <clears throat> this, uh, let's do a static schedule on, this is code I generated on 20 cores. And so here's a static schedule where everybody gets exactly, I don't know, 20 jobs or 10 jobs, maybe seven in this case, one, two, three, ten jobs. And when there's a large variation in the amount of time it takes each job to finish, then a static schedule tends to be less efficient than a dynamic schedule. And so here's the same, here's the same schedule, but in a dynamic way. So it's able to load balance a little bit more. And so probably to answer your question, I don't know that multiprocessing is doing a static necessarily, but there are different types of dynamic schedules as well. And that may have either fit the data better, or it might be that it's just more efficient. Uh, OK, it's 1220. I want to show you one cool thing. Um, so in terms of parallelism, IPython is pretty amazing in the sense that it's fault tolerant and it's elastic. And what I mean by that is you can lose, um, you can lose an engine. So it, say you're running 12 engines on Janus. And for some reason, your code just kills an engine. It doesn't stop the whole process. In fact, IPython will just say, oh, I've lost an engine. Which jobs were on that engine? I'll reschedule those jobs on the resources I still have. Um, it's also fault tolerant in the sense that you can, you can tell IPython if the job failed or not. And if it failed, it will retry it a certain number of times um, that you specify on a different engine. So here's the same uh, workload we just looked at. And what I did was I had each job fail like 3% of the time, just randomly fail. And then I had, at some point, after a couple minutes, I logged in and killed three engines running. So you can see these big white gaps at the bottom here. Those are just places where I just, my IPython engines are just dropping off of my resource. And what's amazing about this is you can't do this with MPI, which is sort of the standard way historically to do distributed computing. You, you lose an engine your whole job quits. Um, you, you, an engine, you know, if a trial fails, you might lose your whole job. And so IPython Parallel has been really great for making things run in parallel that you can't make run with MPI. So independent simulations that just sometimes fail or sometimes run nodes out of memory. Um, if you have that situation, you should think IPython Parallel for, for doing some, some of your parallelism. All right. We have eight minutes left. I think that's probably not enough time to really get into Spark um, or Scikit-Learn, for that matter. So I might start concluding. Let's see here. OK, so here's, here's what I thought for, for conclusions. Um, I hope you got a little bit of a feel of what it's like to work in the notebook uh, without necessarily typing in Python code. It's just a great interface for working with data, doing exploratory analysis, where you can see kind of your flow. And it's very easy to share those results. And I didn't go into how you do that, but it's, it's trivial to create an HTML file or um, share a notebook or convert it to LaTeX. And so it's a great way to, to work on things, to collaborate on things. And I, I actually like it as a, as a development environment for certain types of Python. So I hope you, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I hope you learned a little something about what, what the new landscape of Python can really do. And that is, um, you know, we have data frames with pandas. We have uh, ways to parallelize our code that make it fairly straightforward if you use the map function. And we didn't get to Spark, but um, I think I've said it enough that if you have some really large data sets, you might consider Spark. It's amazing to do iterative programming from a web browser on gigabytes of data uh, in a reasonable amount of time. I just don't know any other, I don't know any other language that lets you do that. 
other than Scala in the Scala notebook. Um, and then I think finally, the, my, my hope is that in just two hours, it's hard to take away any sort of specific, specific thing, but I hope you feel inspired to maybe convert part of your workflow to Python or maybe you saw something in Python that you enjoyed. Um, it's a really, it's a growing ecosystem. It's just been killing it the last few years. Um, so I hope, I hope you got to see some of the things um, that I've enjoyed using. I, I wish we'd had another hour or two. I'm sure that would have been challenging in some ways. But anyway, uh, that's, that's all I'm going to talk about today. Uh, if you have any questions, you can send me an email or we can chat at lunch or something like that. So thanks for, thanks for coming. Amazon, yeah.